to be speaking to 3,000 people about the epithelium. These are my financial disclosures. Obviously, some of them intersect with the epithelium. And I'll just give you a little history of where this has come from. So I was at Cornell as a research fellow before my residency in New York and started measuring a rabbit eye on the bench one evening and I was measuring the optic nerve and just scanning everything with this high frequency ultrasound transducer and I could see the epithelium on the cornea and I asked Cal Roberts who was the head of cornea at the time if he would have a look and he was very kind he came around he into the office I displayed the image on the vax he used to type in some uh, command codes to display the image and I said would the measurement of the epithelium be uh, is there anything that you can use this for uh, this is pre-residency I didn't know anything and he goes like this. No. And for all of you young ophthalmologists here, let me tell you, that's the moment you're looking for. When a gray-haired expert says that something which hasn't been done before has no applications. That's the big golden open door. And I went to the internet and I looked it up and there was one publication on the measurement of the epithelium in vivo in humans. One. And it was Brian Holden and he was doing contact lens research. He was looking at epithelial edema overnight with an optical picometer with you know, uh, an image that's expanded and like totally inaccurate. I was like, oh my God, this is the rest of my career right here. So we got onto it and immediately started scanning. And I'm looking at Dimitri over there because he sent us, uh, he came to New York actually, we did this Reese Buchler's case that it had PRK, PTK in one eye, but not the other. And so we had, you know, the, the, this, this con control experiment situation and we published it very quickly as a letter. And I think that's the only paper that you and I are on together, Dimitri, which is quite extraordinary. Um, but um, there's also a rabbit study. Too. Oh, there was the rabbit study with with with, with um, uh, Norma. That's right. No, Norma and Wallace. That's right, and Wallace. Okay, so anyway, I slaved away for six months analyzing every line of 20 scans to make one map of the epithelium, and it was the first one that I had seen or anyone had seen. But it was only three millimeters wide. And we worked hard to make this into an ARC scanner to get 10 millimeters. Of course, in the meantime, people, other researchers were starting to realize that the epithelium was important, specifically with PRK. And Torin Miller Pedersen in uh, James Cavanagh's lab, um, he was using confocal. He had a little tiny little window as well. He was looking at haze. And Charlene Gauthier was doing this in, in Sweden for her PhD. And OCT was still a bit primitive, right? It was, um, I can't remember if this is frequency or spatial domain. Anyway, the resolution wasn't very good for epithelial measurements, but someone actually took these OCTs and made maps. And then the interest started to come. And I'll, I'll go back, I'll, in a minute, I'll tell you where the interest started. But essentially, we ended up with six millimeter maps. I worked very closely with um, uh, David Huang and, and the group there to try and insist that there was a nine millimeter map, which they then did. But the first commercially available epithelial map came in 2016, okay? So think about it. I measured the epithelium in 1991 and it was, well, you do, the, do the math, it's a long time. Now here, for the young ophthalmologists here, when you pick this one thing, this big golden door, make sure it's something, something that no one is gonna have any interest in for a long time. And make sure it's something that you can present at meetings so you don't get accused of being secretive. But everyone just goes, just like straight over their heads, no interest, whatever, yeah, yeah, there's that thing with the Reinstein thing with the ultrasound pain in the ass with the water bath. Well, I got 45 publications on the epithelium into the literature before the first commercial map was able to be made. And so that's a key, right? You've got to have something that passes the three stages of invention that Schopenhauer taught us, which is stage one, totally ignored, stage two, violently opposed, stage three, accepted as inherently obvious. And then if I was having a beer, I'd be like, hey Art, there's a fourth, there's a fourth stage. He goes, what's that? 
it's when everyone thinks it was their idea. Yeah? <laughs> so, here we go. So, now we have, okay, now we have a room of 3,000 people and we're talking about the epithelium. Because we now have OCT measuring epithelium, which is far more convenient than high frequency ultrasound. Slightly less accurate, slightly less resolution, but very good. And with all of these devices, you know, I'm not married to ultrasound, I'm married to the epithelium. And so I have like 12 devices in my clinic to measure epithelium. I have three insight machines and all of these OCTs. For me, one of my OCTs is the substitute for the Javal keratometer that used to be next to my slit lamp. And this is the slit lamp of the 20th century, and this is the slit lamp of the 21st century. So I examine my patients, and whatever I need to look at in more detail or measure or ingrowth or anything, scars, depth, I just swing things over and I am looking at the slit image of the OCT live and I'm changing the angle, doing raster scanning, changing the brightness, the contrast. I can actually do this on my chair, not looking at static images from a technician who's acquired it in another room. So let's go to some background which I hope most of you now know about, so I won't spend too much time on it, but we know that the epithelium is not a single thickness layer as it used to be thought. It is about 50 microns in the center, okay that's true, but it's thicker inferiorly and it's thicker nasally. And this is a mirror image. How the hell does it end up in this shape? I mean what's going on? Well, way back in 94 when we started looking at this, it became obvious that it was due to the eyelid dynamics. Remember the tarsus is semi-rigid. And so because this semi-rigid membrane is passing over the cornea 10,000 times while you're awake, and then it's sitting on the cornea for seven hours while you're sleeping, this is a force inwards. And if the force inwards is equal to the growth out force outwards, then you have equilibrium. And the reason we know the, the epithelium is one micronically, totally steady, and does not change in profile is because you can wake up at six o'clock in the morning and put your glasses on and they're clear. And you can be at two o'clock in the morning, sat Sunday, you know, midnight, Saturday, partying at the, you know, uh, the discotheque having had four tequilas and your glasses still work. That's how tightly the epithelial profile is controlled. And the only way this can happen is if you have equal and opposite forces in a biological system. Remember, microns make a difference to the curvature. So, we've done a lot of work in the 90s and, therefore, and, and further on on the epithelial changes. And these are the early studies, Charlene Gauthier, her PhD, Torben, and we were measuring, of course, with the full thickness. And we were starting, because we could measure the stromal thickness as well. And we were learning that the stroma expands in the periphery. This then became an editorial that um, uh, B.J. Dupes and, uh, and, and uh, 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 Cynthia Roberts um, then published uh, you know, their own papers later as part of his PhD. But look at how where the stroma thickens, the epithelium thins. So these dynamics are starting to be understood. And the fact that the higher the myopia you treat, the more the epithelium thickens. But the higher the myopia you treat, the flatter the response. And therefore, the lower myopia has more of a refractive shift due to the epithelium than the higher myopia. So this is all part of, it's all in the paper. Now we're looking at using OCT. So now every single patient gets epithelial mapping. Every single patient. There's no barrier to entry anymore. And the pattern, for example, of myopic change from, the, um, fr from, from LASIK is like a lenticule, but in SMILE it's different. And so there's a lot of theory that we have about this, biomechanics and the minimum thickness that we use in lenticules. We've studied the longitudinal chains of the epithelium, so this is pre-op, 24 hours later, one month, three months, six months, 12 months. These are difference maps between the time points. You can see that most of the change occurs in the first 24 hours. Some more change happens from one day to one month, but from three months, there is no longer any change. So when you say, oh, it's the epithelium causing regression, at six months to one year, it's not. It's not the epithelium. The epithelium is stable by then, okay? It's something else going on. We studied hyperopic LASIK, and this is why 
everyone went away from hyperopia because it was not understood that we were using the wrong parameters to determine the safety of hyperopic corneal surgery. Having studied this and having you know, uh, really understood how the epithelium thickens in the trough and thins over the increased curvature of the ablation, we now know why you can do high hyperopic LASIK on the cornea and still maintain safety. It's because if you look at the maximum K post-op against the epithelial thickness, obviously the thicker part in the well gets thicker because you've ablated more, but while the thinnest part gets thinner, it's not the same in all eyes. And so here's an example of a very flat cornea that had a plus one residual and would have had an enhancement, but I didn't do the enhancement because the epithelium was already at the threshold of breaking down, which is 26 microns. Here's a cornea with a SIMK of 50 where the epithelium was 44 and I could do a plus 225 enhancement in this eye, even though the keratometry was 50. So the keratometry is a proxy for what you can do in steepening, but it's the wrong number to be relying on. The number is the epithelium. The epithelium is what breaks down, which causes repeated trauma and scarring. So that is how you make it happen. And you can have a obviously a steep cornea with thin epithelium, but you can also have a steep cornea with thick epithelium. And so being able to distinguish these cases is how you can do safe hyperopic treatments. This is the same point made again. We all know that the epithelium gets thinner in keratoconus. Well, obviously, ectasia is a form of keratoconus, and the whole of... And this is why the OCT companies started spending money on developing OCT for epithelium. Because when I started presenting the fact that you could detect keratoconus earlier when the epithelium is, you know, compensating for the cone and you can avoid these ectasias without a cause, no one listened. Because ectasia is rare, who cares? I'm not going to do a water bath for one person out of a thousand. But when I showed that the epithelium can be the cause of the inferior steepening. And actually, you can use the epithelial map to exclude keratoconus in a cornea that looks keratoconic, and you can do LASIK on it, that's monetization. So suddenly, it became a commercial interest to measure epithelium pre-LASIK. And you know, I'm sorry to say, but that is what drove it. I, I, I saw it in my own eyes. I'm just telling you the little secret in here, and don't tell anybody else. But we know that the parameters change as expected, and using that difference between the pattern of a keratoconic eye and the pattern of a normal eye, we can exploit this for screening. Here's a case where, okay, it's a flat cornea, very flat cornea, hyperope, 2012 best corrected, normal topography, normal tomography, bad D, 0.61, it's a sunny day, LASIK. No, here's the epithelial map, there is the focal thinning with the thickening around it, and that is, that's a pattern deviation, and it is coinciding exactly with the elevation on the Bellin plot. The classifier, which we published in IOVS, classifies as a keratoconic, even though all the topography and tomography are normal. So this is avoiding ectasia without a cause. And the beautiful thing is that at the time, I had to use, you know, an atlas, a pentacam, and, you know, an, an Artemis and, you know, do all of these different machines. And now I can take all of these maps in one and a half seconds with one device. So we devised this keratoconus screening profile where you can look at the Gaussian posterior surface and the epithelial profile on the same chart and actually look at the coincidence of thinning of the epithelium with the back surface elevation. Or you can look at it in other ways. So we can use the epithelial thickness map to, for example, look at a weird cornea and, you know, which clearly we're not going to do LASIK on, but we can confirm and you can see how the ultrasound map is very similar now to the MS-39 and that's all on one panel. Or, for example, you can take a cornea that you would not do corneal surgery and you would have, so minus six, oh, ICL, definitely ICL. Bad D, one point, wait a minute, the bad D is not too bad. Well, I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, oh, wait, the epithelium is totally thick there. There's absolutely no way that that steepening is epithelial thinning over a cone. No way. And actually, the MS-39 gives us the same result, and the classifier tells us it's normal, and we do LASIK on this patient, or oh, the Hansatome. This was 20 years ago. 
or not, no, 10 years ago. Then you can have, again, these totally normal topography and tomography examples, you know, normal, 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 but the epithelial map shows a little bit of thinning and fairly here, and when we correlate that again with the back surface of the bellin, we see that there is coincidence. And so suddenly we are, holy moly, that's keratoconus. We do not do corneal surgery in that map. Now, of course, since 2012, we now started to get these publications about how keratoconic eyes have different epithelium from normal eyes. Yeah, we don't care about that. Because if you already knew it was keratoconic and you scanned it, you don't need the epithelium map. It's already keratoconic. What we need is a way of distinguishing which eye that looks normal on topography could be keratoconic. And that is about resolution. So understanding how the epithelium behaves is the final part, and this bleeds into therapeutic refractive surgery of the cornea. As you know, I'm the section editor for the Journal of Refractive Surgery. Send all your complications to us. The epithelium thickens to fill any depressions. Alfred Vogt described that in 1926. It thins over the peaks. It is chain, the change is proportional to the amount of change of stroma. It is defined by the rate of change of curvature. So you have a small two millimeter hole, it's 90% compensated. If you have a four and a half millimeter hole, which was PRK in 1994, you get 40% compensation. And as David O'Brien showed, when you expand the optical zone, you, get, you need less overshoot to end up on target, there's less regression due to epithelium. The law of epithelial compensation came out when we were scanning a, a lot of abnormal corneas, and this was our ARVO presentation, where we just said it's very simple. If there is irregular astigmatism, there is irregular epithelium. Why? Well, because if an eye presents with irregular topography, by definition, the epithelium has reached its maximum compensatory function, leaving irregularity on the surface. So what you're looking on the surface is irregular, but the stromal surface is more irregular because the epithelium has masked some of the irregularity. So you have to look at the epithelium because you can have three identical topographies with three different stromal surfaces. And this means that wavefront guided repair and wavefront, corneal wavefront guided repairs can be totally wrong in terms of regularizing the stromal surface, if you haven't looked at the epithelium. You cannot judge the corneal irregularity from its cover. Always measure the epithelium. And I will end with the anecdote that I have a lot of friends out here, and it's great to see everybody and you guys. And I know you all say that I've spent all this time on the epithelium and that I am very superficial. Thank you very much.